Greetings everyone, Brett here with Hammerhead Model Making for another episode. Today I will be building Dragon's Tiger 1 and I will be building it as the vehicle that Otto Carius drove. Now this is my first like real full dragon kit and I know that they have somewhat of a reputation of being greatly over engineered and you know having five pieces to make something that could have been made in one piece however um i was building this specifically for otto's vehicle and since his vehicle had zimmer it and it was already boxed as his vehicle i figured you know what why not i'll uh i'll give it a shot here so i dove head in and um Yes, there are times when it feels like it is somewhat over-engineered and, and uh, you know, very high part count. The overall process wasn't terrible. Um, and I, it, it, there was only a few parts in the build where I really kind of thought to myself, man, I wish I was building something a little bit more simple. But, um, you know, I, I was actually quite happy with it. If, if you were to do it right you'll notice here i'm putting in all the torsion bar suspension for the for the road wheels if you actually do it right you could theoretically have a working suspension uh it would work just like a real torsion bar suspension would however um i found that if if you only glued the end part of the torsion bar some of the torsion arms were kind of out of position out of alignment so i ended up just gluing everything set so that it was in one position but you know, theoretically, you could uh, you could make that work as a as a functioning torsion bar suspension. Um, you could also use it to do uh, if you had like a very specific diorama you wanted it driving over some railroad tracks or some rubble or something. It would be very easy to pose all the road wheels very dynamically, and um, so I, honestly, I'll I'll give it some props for that. You you can you can work a lot with what it gives you to to do something really interesting. I think. Um, so I, you just saw there putting all the road wheels together. This is a tiger. So there you have bazillions of road wheels to work with. Uh, you got to make sure they're all cleaned up and ready to go, but they weren't, they weren't terrible. Um, like I mentioned before, the, one of the reasons I got this kit specifically was because it had the Zimmerit and, um, I didn't want to have to deal with, you know, putting my own Zimmerit on or using Zimmerit decals or resin Zimmerit. I just, I wanted a tiger one kit specifically for this vehicle that had Zimrit. And even though the Zimrit's pretty subdued on this, um, it's still somewhat visible once it, the paint's on. And uh, so I was, I, I'm, I'm quite pleased with it. Um, putting all the, the Pioneer tools and bits and bobs on the back here, on the back uh, armor plate, uh, there's a lot that goes on there. And for the most part, I was gonna paint everything in place. There was very few things that I left off to paint separately. Um, a nice thing here is you do get radiator detail that you'll be able to see through the, the radiator grills on the, on the back deck of the vehicle. So that's kind of a nice touch. Uh, I know some other vehicles or some other manufacturers don't bother giving you that, de that detail. Um, and, and in reality, it would be difficult to see, you know, unless you were looking down directly into the radiator grills. But hey, I like that it's there and I like that you can see it and... I think it's a nice touch and, and really wasn't all that much work, you know, out of my way to, to build it and put it in. So again, I, I'll give it, I'll give them props there for, for including that detail. So construction just continues straight ahead. Um, the upper portion of the hull gets assembled. The, uh, here's those radiator grills I was mentioning before. It's interesting that they're all supplied as separate parts. I think because there are different versions, of, like different grill types that can be put on there, which is why they give you the different the different versions. One, one thing to note here is it's supposed to supply or be supplied with these photo etch meshes that go over the grills, but I was actually missing one, one of the smaller ones. It it, it wasn't in the kit and, and I searched high and low for it, you know, to make sure that maybe it didn't fall out with one of the bags or whatever. It, it wasn't in there. So ultimately I ended up leaving off the, the two smaller grills just so that it was even. Um, in reality, it would have 
it would have had those two grills on the on those on the back side on the, the exhaust part so just just be aware mine mine was missing but i ultimately not a huge deal um i, I still think it looks pretty good without it so adding in some more of the pioneer tools here on the top deck and uh, the tow cables the tow cables were quite nice it came with separate um you know uh mounting parts for it so a little bit fiddly and it took a little while to get them all to sit correct but uh, i think it looks pretty nice getting the barrel here and the muzzle brake done the muzzle brake is multiple parts and so it gives you some good detail on the you know inside the muzzle brake and and uh, didn't require too much cleanup to get it to to look nice so i was quite happy with the barrel even though it's it's plastic you know i know some people would probably replace it with a turned metal barrel but i liked it uh, another interesting feature here is i think that the way this is designed although it's not necessarily called out in the instructions is that th this setup i think you're supposed to be able to have a recoiling gun barrel um kind of a gimmick but interesting so they do supply you know most of the gun breach there so if you haven't hatches all right so putting the commander's cupola together here you can see that the uh, vision blocks are all separate components i think if you were to build this without a figure in the cupola but have the, the hatch open this is good detail to have and uh, obviously you'd be able to see the little bit of the vision block through the actual exterior ports there but <clears throat> I will have a commander's figure in there, so you really won't see a lot of that detail, but it's nice that it's there. It's nice that they provide it, so it's it's a well-detailed part. Um, rest of the the uh, turret going together and uh, adding all the details here. And uh, again, I, I do like the Zimrit texture on the tank turret itself. Um, it it has some variety to it, so it looks it doesn't look machined. It doesn't look, you know like it was done in the computer it, it it looks pretty good i think does the part the only thing that it doesn't have is like missing chunks but i don't think it'd be too difficult to go in there with you know with a knife or something or even like a dremel and kind of remove some chunks of the zimmerit as it gets knocked off in battle conditions um adding the spare track holders here and the bustle I, I i opted not to have spare track links on there 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 was a um a reference picture that i was kind of going off of and and he didn't have the spare track links in there so you can see i've gone ahead and pre-primed some of the parts here to get it all assembled mainly just the uh those radiator details in the back end there and um got some of the top part primed i am using a red primer when it comes to doing german armor I like to use this red primer mainly because actual German armor was primed red. And so one kind of gives a little, <clears throat> little layer of authenticity there in terms of like, well, the actual one, one was done that way. Plus German armor tends to have really warm tones and the, the red primer just helps underlay that, those warm tones. So um, here I'm laying the base color um, and doing it in multiple thin coats I, I i do want a little bit of that red primer to kind of peek through a little bit especially in crevices and corners so just really kind of laying it on in multiple thin coats so that's why you kind of see it you know at times it looks kind of kind of muddy brown that that's why um this is one of the hard parts about doing german armor not only is building all the road wheels but painting them all i know you could you could assemble it all and paint it all on the model and and i get it it's it's kind of an easy shortcut to do just not my style of doing it i i like to make sure everything is primed and painted so that just in case you you know there's a there's an angle that you could be viewing it at that you might see something that would be missed if it was all assembled and put you know put together and then paint it all on the model plus i find it easier to install the tracks when the road wheels and, and the sprocket and everything are all done separately so that's why i chose to do it that way um but the whole model gets this uh gets this base color here this is uh mig paint and uh, i i really like how it how it worked out it looks pretty good and then uh replicating some camouflage using some camo green uh, decided to do this freehand as opposed to trying to you know mask it with like blue tack or poster putty or something uh, just kind of give it a little bit more of a 
um, the feathered edge, as it were. The again, the the reference pictures that I was going off of actually had a whitewash over it, so it was the the pictures were taken during winter. Um, but other references that I've read and and plus the, what the instructions call out is that it had this this green camouflage pattern uh, essentially sprayed on in the field. So that's basically what I was trying to replicate here. Uh, ultimately, I won't be doing the whitewash. Um, kind of going for more of a, a springtime look and uh, and whitewashes are, are really cool if they're done well and I just don't have a good technique yet for doing a whitewash so um, I will I will try it out on a future project I have an idea for a future project that I will be testing out a whitewash on just not this one so stay tuned for that but um, this this camo skein was was pretty simple just uh, you know Gray splot or green splotches all over the vehicle. I didn't spray any under, basically below the skirts. I, I, I didn't notice that it was done that way. So um, one note of this one that might not necessarily be historically accurate is I'm spraying some kill markings here on the front of the barrel. Um, this was not uncommon to have done on German vehicles, uh, especially... Um, you know, things like Sturmgeschutz, you often see kill rings on, on the barrels of their guns. Uh, this this build is a commission build, and the customer wanted to have kill markings on the barrel. So I am happy to oblige, and I'm quite happy with how they turned out. I think they turned out pretty good. And and actually, after, after this initial first batch of rings, we ended up adding more rings. So I, I like how it turned out. With, with all the major paintwork done, now we can seal it all in with a gloss coat. And uh, as, as is typical for me, I'm using Allclad's Aqua Gloss and uh, give it a good healthy coating here because we will be doing some pin washing over it. And it's just easier to do the pin wash over a gloss coat than it is a matte surface. Plus, it allows us to, if we mess up or, you know, really kind of make some bad errors, to, to remove it without harming our underlying paint job. So the whole tank gets coated. Then we add decals. I, I've actually been noticing lately um, on Instagram, a lot of people are doing their pin washes and panel washes and things like that before doing decals. And I find that interesting. I, it's not wrong because they still turn out good looking models. I just find it interesting because I want to be able to do all of my weathering, whether it's a pin wash, whether it's whatever, over the decal so that the decals get weathered along with the rest of the vehicle. So I just find it interesting that people have different, you know, um, orders of operations of, of doing things and, and still are able to turn out good looking models. So I'd be curious to know, do you weather over the decals or do you do a lot of your weathering first and then decals over it? Just curious how that works out for everybody. So, um, here we're painting up the exhaust and I really enjoy painting like rusty exhaust. So here I'm stippling on some Parasite Brown from Vallejo colors. And this is one of my favorite rust techniques. So I stipple on the uh, Parasite Brown. Now I'm stippling on smoke. Smoke. The smoke color is somewhat translucent. Um, so it, it still allows a lot of that Parasite Brown to show through. And then... Um, I just kind of build it up in layers as, as it looks as it looks good, and then finally I add some burnt umber in there, and uh, this is kind of a good kind of a mid tone brown, so it's lighter than the smoke, but obviously darker than the parasite brown and the underlying red. And then finally, I'll, I'll wash certain areas with Agrax Earthshade, and this I'll kind of keep close to the actual exhaust outlet there, where you know soot and dirt and grime would build up, um, and then a little bit of known oil as well to really kind of hit that the darkest parts there. And uh, I, I've used this technique on, on other models before and I, I just, I really like how it turns out. Everything will get a flat coat at the end as well. So it'll kind of tone down those, those washes there. So now we can start working on our, our pin wash. So this is really just trying to get um, a lot of the crevices, nooks and crannies a little bit darker kind of create a little bit of an artificial shadow. There's there's three things that don't scale down when when building a miniature. Um, fire, 
water and shadows. So you'll notice if you look at like old movies that use miniatures and they're trying to replicate fire, it's just it, it's really hard to do because flames don't scale down. Water's the same way. If you're looking at like old movies, like old uh, World War II type movies where they're using models to represent ships getting blown up and sunk, you'll you'll notice that you the, really the only way to tell that it's a miniature is to look at the water because it doesn't scale down. And then finally, shadow. Shadow just does not scale down. And so we use things like pin washes and and things techniques like that to create artificial shadow to kind of Im create implied shadow in certain areas of the kit. So that's why I like to use a pin wash. Plus, it helps kind of pop out details that would normally kind of just get blended in in the overall paint job. I, I definitely consider it an artistic choice. Um, I know that there are modelers out there that like to avoid doing pin washes and things like that and, and creating those kind of strong contrasting shadowy effects. And that's fine, you know, teach their own. I prefer it. I think it just helps um, sell the detail and scale of the model a little bit better than if it didn't have it. So personal preference, again, like the uh, like the detail question, I'd be curious to know, like, what do you guys like to do? How? What kind of techniques do you like to use? Do you do pin washes? I, I'd be curious to know. So uh, painting a lot of the Pioneer tools, uh, again, um, I, I like to do this while we're still under or over the gloss coat because I can still do some weathering over it as we start doing matte coats and, and, and oils and things like that. So that's, that's why I've chosen this step um, or to do it at this time as opposed to like once all the weathering is finished. Uh, I think it just helps tie it all in and blend it all together. So just kind of going over the uh, all the metallic parts with the dry brush. Unless it's specifically called out as like a bright metal. I like doing this black with a metal dry brush. I think it kind of gives a little bit more of a worn effect, a used effect to things like steel. So that's why I choose to do it that way. We're going to give the wood a good wash here, a little a bit of a warm wash. And uh, again, just try to create some, some depth, some shadow, and some variation in the actual wood look. So all the, the wood handled tools, the uh, jack block, it, it all gets the uh, this this wash. And this is a this is a much more redder wash than the Agrax Earthshade. The Agrax Earthshade is a much more earthy, very I'm almost saying black based type wash, whereas this one's more red. So it creates some contrast there. Um, here I am painting the rubber rims of the road wheels. Um, I tend not to try to use an actual black color for this. Uh, rubber rarely is just straight black. Plus, black at this scale just kind of tends to look toy-like or cartoon-like. So I try to avoid pure black. Um, now we're giving everything a matte coat in preparation for oils. And uh, this just helps blend everything together, tie it all together, and uh, gives us a good um, even base coat for everything else that, that comes along. <clears throat> um, one thing I am do so what I'm doing here is chipping the, obviously the base coat of the paint. Um, my normal chipping color is German Camouflage Black Brown by Vallejo. But in this case, I am using Burnt Umber, um, the same color I used on the exhaust stacks at the back. Uh, it's This is kind of like my second choice for chipping, but I, I didn't have access to any of the my normal color. So this, this works in a pinch. Applying it with um, a sponge, kind of just in a general sense, I will then go in with a fine-tipped brush to kind of get some very specific chips that I'm looking for. But in terms of like general chipping, the sponge works pretty good and it allows you to get some good random bits. And then here I'm going in with, um, I believe it is a sand color Vallejo paint to kind of create some highlights uh, along where the chipping would be. Uh, it just kind of helps create some variations, kind of sells like th there's layers of paint on this vehicle and uh, kind of creates a little bit of a 3D effect. So pretty effective, but I, I do this with strictly with a brush. I don't do that with a, with a sponge. 
So now we're gonna start working into oils. And I didn't wanna to go too heavy on the weathering on this thing. You know, I didn't want this like caked in, in months of mud and layers of mud, but I, I kinda of wanted to give a sense that it was dirty and it had been used and would, had been out in the field for a little while. So um, really what I'm doing <clears throat> at this point is laying down a nice layer of odorless thinner and then and then applying the, the oil paint and and then applying more thinner to kind of help blend it in and um kind of the really th the first time i've used this specific technique on an armored vehicle I, I have been experimenting with doing this kind of thing on aircraft um and i'm, I'm really liking how it the, the results that it gives and it's not a lot of effort to to kind of really push this this dirt and and weathering with oils um oils is definitely something that i'm still kind of finding my groove on as it were um, I have been using it now for a couple of years and I'm still trying new things with the oils trying to figure out new ways of using them and um, I'm I'm pretty happy with with my experimenting on this um, was really able to dirty up the underneath underside of the vehicle um, around the exhaust you know and 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 cr kind of create some cool uh, some cool tones there. So at this point we can start adding on a lot of our, a lot of all the little pieces that we've been painted off separately, the road wheels, for example, the exhaust you saw there, and, uh, really kind of start tying this vehicle together as we, as we near the end here. So, um, a lot of road wheels to put on a very specific order to put them on, uh, to, in order to, you know, create that overlapping interweaved, look that the tiger is so iconic with um the tracks themselves were again primed in red and then sprayed with steel and then we go in with some different um <clears throat> weathering techniques to to dirty those up and unfortunately i didn't film them so i apologize but basically it consisted of a couple of washes and and some and some pigments and and uh, weathering powders now another fun part, something I love about weathering armored vehicles is flicking mud everywhere. I just, it, I think it adds a really cool random dynamic look to a vehicle just to kind of flick some some mud on there. And I'm just using some diluted acrylic paint and it, I think it works. I think it looks good. So um, we can throw the vehicle on a base and throw a figure on there and call it good. <clears throat> this was an enjoyable kit. I, I know Dragon has a reputation, and I'm sorry my, my voice is going, but bear with me just for a little bit longer. Um, I really enjoyed the kit, and I really didn't find too many major issues. I, I think um, I think it turns out pretty good and is a convincing Tiger 1 with Zimmerit. So let me know what you think in the comments down below. If you're not subscribed, I'd appreciate a subscription. At the very least, hit the like button on this video if you liked it. Leave a comment. Tell me what you think about decals, about pin washes and weathering. And uh, we'll see you on the next vehicle. Or <laughs> we'll see you on the next video. Thanks for watching, everybody. Take care.